before we go to our passage this morning, uh, one of the things that crossed my mind as I was just thinking about our community, our little city that we live in, wherever, wherever that may be, wherever you call home. And I was reminded that in the midst of everything we're, we're going through, and I've talked a lot about in my own personal life about how things have kind of come to a stop. We see so many things in our lives where, like, hey, why, you know, what do we do? We're sitting there and waiting, and yet the needs of the people, those that are hurting, those that um, just, that maybe aren't visibly hurting, but underneath are hurting, those, can, those needs have continued. They have not ceased. And so as we find ourselves in this time of inactivity in so many ways, we need to be mindful of the fact that those needs, in many ways, are even more pressing. That we not allow ourselves to give up that call that the church has from Jesus. Our passage this morning is from James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. Again, it will be displayed up. It looks like it's, we had some technical issues, so I'm sorry. Some of it looks like it's not on the screen. I will work on that next Sunday. So uh, follow along on there, or if you would prefer to follow on your Bible, or in your Bible, please do that as well. That as well. Okay. Again, James chapter 2. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warm, and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is it? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. My sermon in a sentence this week is this. Good works that Christians are called to are the natural outpouring of the Spirit who resides in each of us in order to magnify Christ. Now I believe that the phrase good works, or you may hear good deeds, has gotten a bad rap at times. I find that in many cases there's a misunderstanding about what the role of works is in our Christian life whether it has a role in our salvation or not. My goal today is to help you better understand what the purpose of good works is, as well as how it has fit through all the time in God's redemption plan. So first, we are not saved by good works, but rather saved for good works. Now, before we go any further, we need to address the elephant in the room, which is verse 24. Okay, let me read that to you again. It says, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Perhaps you find yourself saying, wait a minute, 
Doesn't the Apostle Paul teach us that we are saved by faith alone? Yet, James here seems to indicate that we are justified by faith and works. This is a common, uh, seeming contradiction that many non-believers will press in on. Okay, I remember as I went through seminary, we talked about some of these potential controversial verses. These passages that, if you don't understand the context of what's going on here, or the word choice... You can quickly be trapped and say, something is amiss here. How can I rely upon this document that we say is true, and yet we find ourselves at a crossroads? But as I just mentioned, it is so vital that we stop and consider the context and the word choice that is used by James in chapter or in verse 24. Because when we evaluate any piece of literature, so all of you English buffs out there, you know when you study poetry versus historic, a historical document, you have to consider the context and the form of the writing. This is uh, important. You know, something that I learned in, in seminary, probably the one thing that sticks out, like a phrase, if I had to remember one thing that stuck out to me, it was this. It was... Any, any text, or sorry, any, yeah, any text without context is just pretext. Now let me say what that means. That means is if you take a text and you don't have the greater context, you are very likely to come up with a conclusion that was never intended. The other part of that saying I remember was context is king. I tried to find a great example of this. I remember reading one in a book years ago. It was like, if you found a piece of a letter, but you didn't have the whole thing, if you didn't realize that it was a love letter, but you picked it up, you would probably misunderstand the meaning of it. But once you realize, oh, this is a love letter, then some of the passionate language that was in there is, okay, this makes sense, why they're using some of the word choices that they are. And so this is, a, this is a, one of those soapbox issues for me. Because too often we use a verse here, or a verse there, or a couple of verses to make a point. Or to use a verse here or a verse there to determine what the overarching message is here. And we have to be really careful here, because taking one verse here out of context can lead us in, a, uh, in the direction of false teaching, and even heresy. So we've got to be very careful. And so think about the time we find ourselves in as a country. I'm not talking about the conflict that's going on. I'm talking about that we are in an election cycle. Okay, I like to refer to it as spin cycle season. Think about how easy it is to take a, a, uh, a speech and extract out a word or a phrase here, a word or a phrase there, twist them around, put them together, and all of a sudden you've got a message that is the complete opposite of what was intended. Now, how much harder is it for someone to do that if they say, here, I'm going to present for you my case against a candidate. Here is their unedited, complete speech. It's very, it's impossible to twist that because now you're leaving it to the, 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 to the viewers to understand the context. And so, we must, as believers, hold to this fact that, yeah, we, we don't have all day, unfortunately. You guys won't put up with me that long. To go through all of Scripture. Okay, that's just not practical. But we have to be mindful as we go forward in our study that we're not just plucking verses here and here and here without having done careful study. And when we run into these controversial topics or verses, that we don't run from them. Because if we truly believe that all of Scripture is God-breathed and useful and profitable for teaching, and that it is all consistent, then we should have faith that it will show itself to be consistent and true. And this is no different. Now, having said that, that's my long diatribe again about my feeling on this and sometimes how we tend to study things out. 
Now, here, when James uses the word justified, we need to understand that the original word he used meant proven or demonstrated. This is a very different use of the word than what Paul did in Romans chapter 3, verse 28. Okay? In Romans chapter 3, Paul used the word justified to say we are declared righteous before God. Okay, let me emphasize the difference there again. Paul is saying you are justified, you are declared right with God by faith. James is saying you are justified by the works because that proves or demonstrates that your faith is in Christ. A good example of this would be at home when I ask myself, what do my kids really believe? You know, what are they hearing from me? What do they really believe? I want to impart things on them. And if I, so we had a situation where we told our kids, we want you to stay indoors in the morning until we're ready to go outdoors. Eliza, she's not in here, she won't be too embarrassed by this, but it's, it's, it's a learning process. She, yes, fully on board. I think she believed, you know, I thought she believed that was the right thing to do, and where did I find her the next morning? Outside of the trampoline. And so in that case, what that action revealed to me was, she didn't really believe what I thought she believed or what she professed to believe. It's the proving out, it's the bearing out of what we say we believe. And if we're honest with ourselves and think back to what I said about the heart last week, those types of hypocritical actions reveal themselves in our lives all the time. James chapter 2, verse 24, this verse we're focused on, is part of a larger discussion of how people demonstrate their transformation by their actions. He says, show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Having faith by no accompanying works is useless. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now here's what the NIV says about this verse. It says, you see that a person is considered righteous by what they do, and not by faith alone. The New Living Translation says, So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. James here is making the point that the proof of our faith is our action. We are not declared right by God through, or I'm sorry, we are declared right by God through faith, and the fact that we have been made right with him is demonstrated in our actions. It is for this very reason, when we see a transformation done in a person's life, we tend to say, okay, fruit needs to be borne out before we allow for certain freedoms to be given to them from a human perspective. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. Salvation results in a changed life. We are saved by grace through faith alone. Hear that? That is where I stand. We are saved by faith alone. We are not saved by works, but we are saved for works. True faith is always accompanied by works, by obedience. To Christ. And this is the point James is making. The Apostle Paul in Galatians said this, verse two, or chapter 2, verse 16, Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ. So we also believe in Jesus. In order to be justified by faith and not by works of the law, because by works no one will be justified. So what I want you to take away from here is if you come into contact with people that will point to this seeming contradiction, whether it be with James and Paul trying to pit scripture text against, go back to that we need context. And if we don't know the context, don't rush to just try to give a half-hearted answer. A lot of times that ends up being insincere and, 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 and say, you know what, that's a great point. I need to go back and revisit that and study that out for myself. Second point, good works are an outward display of our inward faith. J. 
James very pointedly addresses this in verse 15 and 16 with a very real example. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says, go in peace, be warm, and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? This speaks to the understanding that a significant part of meeting the needs of those around us is making a priority to meet physical and emotional needs. Because let's be honest, how easy is it for you to pay attention if your stomach is growling? Or when you're tired or angry? Or you aren't sure where your next house payment is going to come from because you got laid off? I recall a story that I heard years ago. It's a true story in Iowa, in the, in the town where we were living. And it was of a family. And they, it was discovered by someone, some connection within our church, that the family was so badly off, they were using old, or they were using old clothes as toilet paper. I remember a very direct conversation I had with one former student one day, and she said to me, um, my dad needs a different car. He needs it for work, and it just keeps breaking down. And so, but, but he has to keep piecing it together because we don't have money for a different car. When a physical or emotional need is pressing, we cannot overlook that and the impact it has on their spiritual needs. We must be willing to speak into and engage the whole life of those we're ministering to. Don't overlook the, the physical needs that are, are present, because that's an access point. This pandemic has left all of us uh, with a major shock to our system. I'll be honest, for a couple of months, I was having a real struggle knowing how to operate. How do I do life as I've always known it in a way that's adaptable, um, but is also living out God's call on my life? I, in some ways, I think it's been an interesting test case, or case test, excuse me, to watch how has church ministry changed? And how are we and how effectively are we continuing to engage those that are in need? When our programs shut down, do we still meet the needs of the people? When people have different, because we've seen the full gamut of, of reactions and opinions across our country, across the world, about what the response is or should be. But these are great opportunities Regardless, because the needs of con the concerns and needs have only increased, that we need to be we need to be present with people. We need to be less worried about what's the right response or who's right in all of this, because all that does is create division. We need to be focused more on there are people hurting in this. There are jobs that have been lost. There are uh, people that have lost their lives. What is our role in the church? We have to be even more so, I would say, slow to speak and quick to listen. Everyone has a story, and in this time, it seems, when I listen, everyone has lots of stories right now about what has affected them, both positive positive. And negative. Are we willing to listen? Listen. Are we willing to listen? I am so guilty of, yes, I'm listening, but I'm listening to talk. And I'm not really listening with compassion. Because by listening, and this is a kind of a really mini, like 30 second testimony, by making an intentional effort to listen, that has been my number one goal since I've come up here is to stop talking so much and to listen more. Layton can attest that that's not always been very good. But I try. 
But I have learned so many things about people in the month and a half that we've been here because it reflects what they need prayer for. But also, even if they don't realize it, a lot of times it reflects what their needs are, where they are, what has led them to this. Because we've got to remember, something led you to your current belief about everything, including your response to the pandemic. It didn't just magically pop up. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a response to that. And the same thing is true of everyone else. Do you ever stop to realize we all have gotten these points because of life experience and things we've witnessed and how close we are to those who have been maybe directly affected by it? Okay? The Bible doesn't tell us that we need to, it doesn't tell us we should be fighting over this thing that says no. We need to love each other and continue through grace because he first forgave us and first loved us we are to continue that. That call has not stopped. People are great at being chameleons. We're very well versed in being able to change who we are uh, based on our surroundings. From an early age, even one, two years old, kids, have been trained to be chameleons. I watched my son, even at his young age, and he, in some small ways, has adapted and changes his behavior based on those who are around him. This is not something that we grow into as adults. In fact, in some ways it's probably, well, it's bad all the time, but I saw it a lot in the high school setting when I was teaching there. And yet, this time is great because it is through anxiety Anxiety and, and some fear, that's the great equalizer. When we face anxiety in our lives, then we start to realize that our true colors are shown. And we realize this is the very reason why many people need, myself, we need a time of crisis. We need something. We need God shows up in those times of trial. Because then we realize when our life is smooth, smooth sailing, we think we're doing just fine. Why would we need anything else? But then when we hit the road bumps of life, all of a sudden, our true colors show up, and we realize we need a Savior. So when our physical and emotional needs are heightened, our ability to receive spiritual truth is greatly hindered. But these are great opportunities to meet the needs of those in our community. And in our overly individualized society, I think this is a very pertinent question. Are we even aware of the needs of the people around us? Could you tell me what the needs are of your neighbor, even if they live a mile down the road? I think of the expression that, that um, not just thoughts or prayers. That's been something, I don't know if you guys have seen that as much as I have. It was kind of a bigger, made, uh, bigger light or shed more light upon when there was a lot of the school shootings that were taking place. And I would see blurbs of, we don't watch your thoughts and prayers. And it was people crying out, yeah, they do want our first thoughts and prayers. Those thoughts and prayers are important. But there also needs to be flesh in the game. It, it, it is a, yes, we have faith that God is in control, but yet, what is our deeds in this case? What are we as believers supposed to do as well? And so when we say, you know, good luck, you know, somebody comes and says there's a need, and you say, well, good luck with that, I'll pray for you, and then you walk away, or go in peace, as it was said in there, what, are we, what message are we sending? Because praying for the needs of the people is a way of saying, Lord, and this is something, this is the Holy Spirit, I really believe in this part especially. And it was, in this way, when we pray for people's needs, we say, Lord, we love you, and we know that you are sovereign over all. So we know God is in control. Help us go forth and meet the needs of the people in a way that brings you glory and honor. So when we pray for people, we are saying, God, you are in control. We can't do anything of eternal value. 
But when we also follow up by meeting the physical and emotional needs, we are saying, Lord, I love my neighbor. I know that you have told us that our neighbors are those who are in our midst, who we rub shoulders with. Thank you for giving me the sensitivity to those in need, the compassion to care, and the courage to take action. Sorry, I'm having issues with this thing today. Bring others along with me. So thank you for the compassion and the courage. Bring others along with me to impact our community in powerful ways for you. Thank you for ordaining the crossing of paths with those in need. And give me the strength to continue and the boldness to share your truth, their need for Jesus. And it is, the, it is only by the love and grace you showed me that I have the wherewithal to go and do likewise. Third point, good works are for God's glory, not our recognition. A great question to ask someone close to you is this. For whom is the benefit of the good works that I do in this, in this world? Because... A lot of times I think I have sincere motives, but those around me might say, you know what, I noticed this. You're looking for praise, or you're looking to be, you're looking to be more well thought of. As I said last week, we are not in the business of show or status. Yet too often we weigh mentally the risk reward. Should I do this, or is it not worth my time? We think about building up our reputation, padding our ego. Lining ourselves up for a future promotion. Lining our pockets more. Or seeking to leverage more power. These things tend to be our special interests. We see an example of this in Matthew chapter 7. Where Jesus says, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons. And in your name perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Jesus is warning believers about false prophets who would do things in his name, but there was, they were doing it out of selfish gain and out of the wrong motivation. However, in Matthew chapter 5, we're going to be encouraged by Matthew chapter 5 that we see the intended motivation that should surround our good works. Here we read, in the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works, and here's the key, give glory to God the Father who is in heaven. Similarly, in Philippians chapter 2, we read, for it is God who works in both, in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It is not about our glory. If we find ourselves doing things for that, we need to shift that, that mindset and say, no, this is for God's glory. This is for God to be recognized, for God to be made known. Finally, this, good works ultimately aim to produce eternal spiritual fruit. Ephesians chapter 4, we read, God has given each of his followers spiritual gifts that we can use for building up the body of Christ. The good works that God intended are best used when we do them in a place of spiritual giftedness. It is when we understand how God has gifted us individually and then being one to be equipped in how to best use those gifts and then being one to activate, launch, and use those gifts into the life of the church and the lives of the community people around us and work in, and even across the globe, that's where eternal spiritual fruit can be harvested. Church, we need your gifts. Don't hide your gifts from me, from the deacons, from the lives of those around you. God gave you those things to use to be fruitful. Luke chapter 10, this should be 
It's a, it's a discouragement to me in some ways, but also an encouragement. Luke chapter 10 says, the harvest is plentiful. God has done the work. There are people all around us. If you wonder where is the harvest, it's there. But what does he say? Here's the discouraging part. But the workers are few. God has prepared the work, but we need to be prepared to go and serve to bring the seed in. I'm not a farmer. Don't claim to be. Uh, I just I like the harvest. You know, give me the harvest afterwards, and I appreciate it. But it, you know, and it's real easy to imagine. You plant the seed, you do all the work, you know, you do all the work, and then you just leave the harvest out there at the end of the day. Nobody's going to do that. You're going to go. You're going to do everything in your power. You might even, you know. Ralph probably could attest there's probably been days he's gone out and got the harvest and he maybe has been as sick as sick as could be. And he went out and did it because he knew if he didn't collect the harvest, it would go to waste. The Westminster Confession of Faith states there are at least six benefits of good works. And they'll be listed up here just so you can see them. First, good works manifest our gratitude to God for the gift of his son. Second, good works bolster assurances of faith. Let me pause for just a second, because I see people, some of you writing, and I was always, uh, I always didn't like it when a pastor wouldn't just say, hey, if you want a slide, if there's a lot of words and you want a slide, take a picture of it, or if you want it, just shoot me an email, and I will gladly send you any of the stuff you want. So I'm always for people writing stuff down, but if you're writing 100 words down and I'm going too fast, just keep that in mind, okay? I, and, pre- and when I go to teach her things, it's like, can you just give us the slide? Like, you get, you have the knowledge, just share it with us. So, um, okay, thirdly, good works are a means of encouraging other Christians towards greater acts of Christ-centered love. Fourth, good works are concrete avenues for adorning the doctrine of God, our Savior, in life and ministry. Fifth, good works silence critics who devalue the goodness of biblical Christianity. And sixth, good works glorify God by displaying his work of love in our lives. I'm not even going to try to speak to any of those things because these were created by much wiser men than myself, um, and much thought and time was in that. Sure, sure. Yeah, sorry, thank you. Yeah, let me. Yeah, um, the last two. So the fifth one is First Peter, chapter two, verses twelve and fifteen, and John chapter fifteen. This is the last one. Sorry, the last one is John chapter fifteen, eight through eleven. Thank yeah, thank you. No, thank you. Don't ever hesitate to, especially when there's an error like that in my slides. So, okay, and uh, so those are the six observations or six points from the confession that I bring up today. Hebrews chapter 10 says this, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. So brothers and sisters, as we prepare to leave this place this morning, remember that good works that we are called to are to be a natural outpouring, a confirmation of the Spirit who resides in each of us in order to magnify Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this gathering that you have called us to, uh, you determined that this was of vital importance to gather and, and equip and hear your word and fellowship and love on each other. Pray we, Lord, we ask that you continue to help us in the lives that we live outside of these walls. There are real hurts that some of us are coping with and needs of others that we ache to help and meet. Take a stirring love, a stirring of your love that we feel, and help us to walk in ways to be faithful to them and to extend your love just as you've extended it to us. We pray that you bless our hearts and minds to know that we have done well in your eyes. 
We pray for your assurance that we are operating within your will. Lord, we know that you have promised to provide for us. We look forward to the ways you will surprise and amaze us with your faithfulness. The lives that you will touch and the people in this room you will use to brighten dark spaces and lift sad hearts. Lord, our passionate worship today is fueled by you. And with the same note of passion created to be the light of the world. To bring color to the dullness. To bring life to dead places. And love to lost faces. Bless our work and our time. Guide our steps and our progress. Grant us power with the Holy Spirit in us to work with us because often it is impossible to get beyond our human stubbornness unless you intercede. Bless us as we leave this place to take your passion with us. Fan its flames so that we can, can give our best contribution. Remind us always of your love as we see our plans, your plans unfold and accomplish the goals that you have for us. Through the, through the power of the Spirit that dwells in us, through our belief in Jesus. Inspire our hearts to seek you in the word daily. Grow us both individually and collectively as we seek the peace of your presence. Help us to walk faithfully and fiercely after Christ, reflecting his love. May we always lift up our progress to you, you who hold the honor and glory for all that we do and all that we are. Use our lives to reach those who desperately need to know you love them. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand for the benediction. And if the worship band would like to come up and... Grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come. Amen.